All right, welcome everyone. Thanks for being here today. Welcome to those of you who are both here in person and you're getting a pretty good audience on Zoom as well. Uh, for those of you not familiar with these seminars, the Midwest Mechanics Seminar Series is a preeminent lecture series on mechanics in the US and among the most prestigious worldwide. It was established in 1957 as a way to bring prominent speakers to Midwest schools, and it currently involves 10 of the most prominent Midwest universities, including us, UIDC, Purdue, Wisconsin, and several others. Um, I'm thrilled today to introduce our speaker, Michael Shelley. Uh, Dr. Shelley is an applied mathematician who works on the modeling and simulation of complex systems arising in physics and biology, including complex fluids. He's a little professor of applied mathematics at the Krant Institute, co-founder of the Krant Institute's Applied Mechanics, Mathematics Lab, excuse me, and the director of the Center for Computational Biology at the Flatiron Institute. He holds a BA in mathematics from the University of Colorado and a PhD in applied mathematics from the University of Arizona. He was a postdoctoral researcher at Princeton University and a member of the mathematics faculty at the University of Chicago before joining NYU. Uh, Dr. Shelley received the Francois Frankel Award from, the, from APS and the Julian Cole Lectureship from the Society of Industrial and Applied Mathematics, and he's a fellow of both of those societies. He's also a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and a member of the National Academy of Sciences. We very much look forward to your lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah, um, let me make sure I have my light going. Okay. So thank you for coming. Thank you for the invitation. Tomorrow I go to Michigan State. And I'm sure the room will not quite be, <laughs> this is a beautiful room. It's a nice place to give a talk. Okay, so I'm going to tell you about a line of, of work uh, of mine and people working with me um, that's been going on 15 years, something like this. Uh, but first, you, you see I have this affiliation uh, Flatiron Institute and the Quran Institute. So I joined the Quran Institute in 1992, but in 2016, uh, I went to the Simons Foundation part-time and I ran a group in biophysical modeling. Uh, that group subsequently became part of the Flatiron Institute, in particular, the Center for Computational Biology, which as you mentioned, I'm now the direct director. And I won't say about all the things that we do, but we're about a 50 person center with several areas in, in biology, a lot in biophysics actually, but also in genomics. And uh, I just wanna say, this is a perfect place to say we have postdoc openings. So if you like what you see, you might, and you're a student, you might think about us. Okay. So active matter. So I'm, I'm, I'm sure that uh, I saw, Practically, I've forgotten who I talked with today, but had practically the same identical opening slide to their work on active matter. But uh, it kind of defines it right there. So active matter, is, as opposed to passive matter, really talks about systems where you have some sort of microscale structure that is active, that's gonna to convert to a local energy source into motion, translation, something like that. And these are some uh, examples. It's been a big area of activity in, in the past 15 years or so. And this is just to give a few examples. I think we've, we've all seen uh, Starling flocks videos. We're, we're all enamored of these these days. Uh, but, but also, these are kind of you know, macro scale swimming and, and flying collectives. And there's a lot of questions about the types of structures and sensing and things like that. How do they interact? Is it sensory? Is it through physical media? Uh, and there's other types of systems that are microscopic, which is more what I'm going to be talking about today. And so this is from uh, Zodomir Dojic's group at UCSB. Before that, he was at Brandeis, showing the types of activities you get when you pull the components, the active components out of biological cells and put them in a more purified system of basically polymers that have motor proteins that couple them and drive them around. And this is a, a beautiful experiment from William Irvine at University of Chicago, where he looks at multitudes of little magnetic uh, beads, they're about a half a micron in size. You're applying a magnetic field to them and they form essentially some sort of liquid-like state, which is being driven by rotation of these beads. So it has all sorts of interesting aspects to it. Okay, so that's 
now where I came into this actually, so Aaron mentioned complex fluids. I really came into this because of some experiments at the time that had been done by John Kessler and, and Ray Goldstein. So I had started to work in biology roughly, but also in, in complex fluids for a while. But here's kind of the basic theme, if you like. It has to do with the difference between a few and many. So this is from the uh, famous video from Howard Berg, Berg's lab at Harvard showing E. coli at rather dilute concentrations swimming around. They're spinning their flagellar bundles. Once in a while, they reverse the direction of spin. That will cause a tumble. They'll go off in some other direction. It's their form of chemotaxis. And then they are just, you know, basically half, you know, haphazardly running around. And then there is, I just want to re remark, there was this famous paper of Phil Anderson's. And one of the themes that he addressed in this paper in Science in 1972 was that there was a qualitative difference between thinking about a few objects moving around and doing things than many objects. And so this is a movie from Zhang Cheng at University of Minnesota showing what happens when you take scores of E. coli and have them at high enough concentration that they can interact with each other hydrodynamically. And what you see is that rather than showing nothing like a featureless plane because they're all moving around independently, there's large scale correlations that, for example, with jets and vortices and so forth, which, is, which are much larger than the size or the speed scales of any of the individuals that make it up. And it's really the fluid that's kind of organizing this motion. And then in the early 2000s, you know, this is a this is a more recent movie, but in the, in the early 2000s, when Ray was at Arizona working with John Kessler, they did some of the first really quantitative studies of this, what was called booming biodynamics, or zooming biodynamics, the rather awkward name they chose at the time, but has since become known as bacterial turbulence. So that's one example. So you have a bunch of objects, they're swimming, they're, they have metabolic needs, they're using that to consumption, they're using that to drive their flagellar motor, motor. There's many of them together, it's kind of a canonical active matter system. So people think of bird flocks and these kinds of things, but really some of the very first foundational examples in this field really come from things like bacterial suspensions or things going on inside of cells. So let me show you another example. And this is, I'm not gonna talk about this today, though this is an area of research in which my group has done an enormous amount of work. And what you're seeing here in this picture is the embryo of a C. elegans nematode, okay? So this embryo was not so long ago, just a plain old egg cell. And it was fertilized by a male sperm coming in here and bringing with it the genetic material of the male, as well as two what are called microtubule organizing centers, these bright yellow spots. And you see with these bright yellow spots, they have kind of processes, as they like to say in biology, these rays are kind of shooting out from them. And those are polymers called microtubules that are growing into the fluid of the cell. And motor proteins, which are evolutionarily engineered little motors will attach onto these microtubules and pull on them if, they're, if the motor is attached to something else. And so what I want you to watch, and this, there's mechanics in this, this is a mechanics problem. The mechanics problem is understanding how the forces that are being transduced through these organizing centers get communicated to the male and female nuclei and they do what they need to do to move into the first cell division. Okay. So what you're seeing here on the right is actually from a, a that should be 2024 actually, is from a paper, a joint kind of computational fluid dynamics uh, experimental paper where we use CFD to help identify what the proper force transaction mechanism was. I keep wanting to press this one, but I should press this one. So here's what happens. Just I'm going to play the movie now. There's the male on the right, female on the left. They move towards each other. They move to the center of the cell. 
that whole object rotates is forming what's called the mitotic spindle, which will take the genetic material that is contributed by both the male and the female and separate them to opposite sides of the cell so that you can have a cell division. And this is a very robust mechanism. It happens across a variety of cell sizes as the organism develops. But there had long been kind of a running argument as to what was actually doing the work here. So I'll just kind of leave it at that, except that motor proteins in large numbers are what's kind of underlying what's going on here. But let me go in a more general way and just remark about what these problems, these two problems share, these bacterial suspensions and this process of getting genetic material inside of an embryo into the right place before there's a cell division. Obviously, they are very complex fluid structure interaction problems. You know, if I have a, a million swimming bacteria and I have the Stokes equations on the outside of those guys, then I have to solve a huge boundary value problem whose solution depends nonlinearly on where all these swimmers are and how they're oriented. Each involves a collection or the collective action of microscopic agents. It's motor proteins in the second case, but it's the swimmers themselves in the first that are performing work on the system in which they're immersed. So they're performing work on the fluid, they're performing work on the nucleus to move it into some place. And in each case, the active agents are force dipoles. Okay, so when the swimmer moves, it's a zero Reynolds number motile object. It, and because it's a zero Reynolds number, then the total force that it exerts on the fluid has to be zero, but it's getting around, but it's a force dipole as far as the outer fluid is concerned. And motors, when they grab onto something to move it, they have to be anchored onto something else. So they are pulling things together. So you typically get force dipoles. It's all kind of Newton's third law. In each of these, the surrounding fluid coordinates the efforts. I'll say more about that by some other examples. And I talk with a lot of uh, high Reynolds, you know, I used to work in high Reynolds number flow myself, but these are problems where the inertia is irrelevant. And it's a very, very different intuition that you have to develop in understanding why these flow problems be behave the way that they do. Okay, and then I say, so because I do cell biology, I have to say cell biology has many such problems. So you think it's important. Okay. How would you understand something like a bacterial suspension? Okay, it looked pretty organized. You know, it was chaotic, things were moving around, but you could see, correla you could see correlated motions in it. Oh, it played without being asked. That's not what I wanted to do. It ruins my uh, dramatic effect. Back up. <laughs> Bless you. But, you know, one approach, it's, it's gonna do it anyway, but, one approach you could take is to do many body interactions in a Stokes fluid. And so this is actually a simulation that we did at Flatiron using a very specialized pack package called a lens, either here or there. But this is a medium scale simulation where we have a couple million model swimmers that are swimming through a Stokesian fluid. They're little swimming rods that have an active stress on one side and drag on the other. And they produce kind of a dipolar flow that's associated with each of these swimmers in the far field being a force dipole. So you put a couple of million of, together and what you see come out of this pretty apparently is that we start off in a state of complete disorder. We take all the swimmers, we place them randomly, we randomly choose their orientation. There is no structure at all. But what you see is the emergence of a lot of structure. You see large scale, large scale things, jets again, vortices that are sitting on the size of this box, which has triply periodic boundary conditions. In some sense, and I'll tell you, this is all because they are a particular type of swimmer. These are swimmers that are like bacteria that they propel themselves from the rear. And the fact that they propel themselves from the rear means from the point of view of the Stokes equations, they are an extensile dipole. They pull fluid in along the waist, they shoot it out in the lab frame, they shoot it out for an aft, 
And that turns out to be a recipe for self-organization, oddly enough. If you had a contractile swimmer, it stays disordered. Okay, so this is, this is impressive. This took, I think it's impressive. It took uh, many, many hours of CPU cores to, to do this. And you know, it gives, we would say, what you see in those experiments with Chang. Uh, active turbulence is impressive. It's very hard to do. There's a lot of really down in the woods or down in the weeds uh, coding going on. Uh, but it's kind of limited, if you like. I love doing these things. But what I want to talk about is the relationship, really, in this talk, between discrete models and how to understand them from the point of view of coarse grain continuum models. Okay, so that's kind of will be a little theme here, and that's my applied mathematics side. So if you have a derived continuum model for something like this, then what you find is you have a PDE that you can probe and understand its stability and instability structure. You can talk, you can understand its dependency upon parameters and you discover, I claim, features in your simulations that were kind of subtle that you might have missed. So let me talk about how you would go through this. This is the classic micro macro modeling and I'm gonna demonstrate it in case of swimmers. But the kind of model we're gonna end up with is basically the form of a Stokes equation, which is describing the solvent in which these agents are immersed. We're just gonna stick with fluid mechanics. It doesn't have to be fluid mechanics. It can be other types of materials that are mediating interactions. And the Stokes equations are being forced by some F, which is the average forces and stresses that are coming from this set of agents moving around, swimmers. And it has its own time evolution. And so if I were thinking of something like a polymer coil that's sitting inside of a fluid, it's, it's coiled up. There is some sort of flow that perhaps it or the boundaries are producing. It stretches the coil, it translates the coil, it rotates the coil. That's all built into whatever this evolution equation is. It's like classic complex flow stuff. And you see, if you stretch this coil in this case, then you have this entropic spring, you stretched it out. And so it's trying to go back to its coil length. And so it creates, in that case, a contractile dipole. It's trying to pull fluid in. But this is the type of structure that we're typically trying to, trying to find. So how might you do this for a collection of swimmers? And this is, this is to some degree, this is classic Doi theory meets George Batchelor. How many people took fluid mechanics at a bachelor's book? <laughs> the few, the hardy, yeah. So here's the picture. Here's a bacterium. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna replace that bacterium with a, basically a slender body. And on the back of that slender body, there's gonna be a propulsive stress. It's gonna have a center, center of mass there, X sub C. And it's gonna have a capsule or a cell body upon which are no boundary conditions is imposed. So it's swimming along with some velocity u along its director, along its axis of orientation p. And to do all of that, it has to exert some force per unit length onto the surrounding fluid. And the total integral of this f has to be zero because it's a force type. So what really creates the f, if you like, is the fact that it is swimming in a sea of flows that are produced by all the other bacteria in the system. This is a, basically a dilute suspension theory. And so here is my one kind of test swimmer. It's got a length little L. I'm going to assume that its length is much smaller than a characteristic flow scale of the flow that gets produced by everybody else. And that just sets up an asymptotics problem and you start working it out. And so you slender body for the Stokes equations. You say, okay, there's my slender body. It's got a center of mass. It's got an arc length relative to the center assigned arc length and an axis. So that kind of delineates the center line of the bacterium. Slender body theory tells you, you solve a little, mic you know, a little micro problem in the presence of a background flow that the center of mass moves with the swimming velocity along the axis plus whatever the background flow is applied to the center. Nothing surprising there. It rotates according to Jeffrey's equation, 
it had you know, P, that orientation vector, has to remain of unit length. And so it's rotated and possibly stretched by the gradient. It looks like a vorticity equation, but you have to filter those changes in length out by this projector out front, that little tensor I minus PP. And then this is the crucial thing here, and that's how it moves. This is the stress that it produces, a single one, like the stress density that contributes to a volume if you're gonna do a control volume argument. It looks like some sigma naught times the rank one tensor PP transpose, or just PP. That turns out when you do the calculation, that's what it looks like. Looks like PP. If I have many swimmers, I introduce an empirical distribution function psi. I'm going to set up a Fokker Planck kind of kinetic type theory. And you can, and you use the control vol volume argument to say that the volume average stress that comes from a collection of swimmers and volume has this form. You're just averaging over this so-called stresslet that I just calculated over the population. And so you're doing a distributional average of this distribution function against PP. So put in other language, this is the second orientational moment of the distribution function. Okay. And then you pass through a distribution into a continuous limit where you assume the psi is continuous. And this is the most basic model I claim for kind of first principles derived by formal asymptotics that you would have for an active suspension. And this goes back to work of mine with David Santillan to mid, to, mid 2000s, 2008, something like that. It has legs, people <laughs> still play with it a lot. Okay, but you have this Fokker-Planck equation, you have conservation particle number, so this psi has to satisfy the Fokker-Planck equation. So you have translational and orientational fluxes. These are the fluxes I just calculated from the single particle dynamics. If you choose, you can add center of mass and rotational diffusion terms to that. And then here is my forced Stokes equation. Here's the F that was on that first slide. It's a divergence of an active stress. Actually, alpha times D is the active stress, where the D is a second moment tensor. Okay, this thing looks like a mess, right? So I have a distribution function that I'm pushing around with the dynamics. I have to do a flow solve to get the velocity to evolve the distribution function. And in 3D, I have five degrees of freedom, three in space, two in orientation. So I could give a whole other talk about moment closures, appropriate moment closures for these types of theories, but I'm not gonna go into that. The main point I want to remark on here is that in this momentum balance equation where I have a fluid being forced by an active stress, so a div dot something, this alpha seen in here has a sign. And if you're a pusher, like a bacterium, you push from the rear, that alpha is negative. If I'm a puller, there's an algal cell called a clammy, it has two cilia, those kind of breaststroke, pulls itself through the fluid. It pulls itself forward, that's called a puller. And the sign of that object is very important to how these theories behave. So let me just show you what you can do with this and just to give you a sense. This is a 2D simulation of that kinetic theory, actually under a, under a closure, which I won't talk about, showing the transition for a for a suspension of pushers, showing the transition from isotropy to something which is more ordered. It's, it's kind of, you know, lots of things moving around, but there's now structure, it's no longer isotropic. And it's showing you the concentration field of swimmers as it's evolving. And this is, you know, from Chang. So at least to your eye, things look kind of similar. Okay, now, Whenever you write down a, a physical system, you like to write down an energy budget, right? You want to look at kinetic versus potential energy. Where do you store energy? How does it change in time? This is exactly that. So for these types of kinetic theories, the 
thing that stands in like an energy for the system is what's called the configurational entropy. And what you do is you form this entropic type term. You average over all the positions and orientations, and you look at the integral basically of psi log psi. And it's normalized by the value of psi or when it's in disorder isotropy, which just turns out to be one over four pi. Okay, anyway. So psi equal to, if psi were a constant, if psi were psi bar, which is its only constant available, actually because of conservation, then this guy would be zero. And it turns out it can only be positive when your psi shows more order than being in disorder, when it's not a constant. And so it turns out this is a, an energy-like quantity. And using the Fokker-Planck equation, I could write it in the following way. Its evolution is a piece that is input power from the swimmers onto the system. So this E is just the symmetric rate of strain for the fluid. And then the thermal parts give you a dissipation, a smoothing in this energy-like thing that's trying to drive it down to zero. But I haven't used the Stokes equations. This is just from Fokker-Planck. And if I look at Fokker-Planck, then it turns out this gives me something that's called an H theorem of statistical mechanics. It says that the, this energy-like quantity evolves through the balance of two terms. One is strictly dissipative. It tries to push you down to zero. And there's another part now that has that alpha in it. And if alpha is negative, as it is for pushers, it says that it's trying to drive the entropy away from zero. This configurational entropy is trying to make a disordered system more ordered, which is what we saw in those large scale simulations starting from disorder. It turns out that if you're looking at suspensions of pullers, then your configurational entropy is always strictly monotonic. It wants to be in a disordered state, kind of featureless state degrees with particle simulations, and it's hard to do the experiments. So what's linear theory tell you? And then this is kind of going, going back again. It says if you have suspensions of, of pushers, then it turns out that disordered suspensions are unstable at long wavelengths. If you're looking at perturbations from the sidebar of equal to one over four pi, then uh, that's an unstable uh, situation. It wants to become more ordered. And it turns out, here's, here's what the growth rate looks like as a, as a function of a plane wave uh, wavelength, not wavelength, wave number. And it turns out that the fastest growing mode, these are very peculiar systems, is actually a k equal to zero. And that's actually consistent with what you saw in those, in those movies, in that one movie, where the scales of the flows that you saw come out were sitting on the system scale. They didn't show a lot of fine scale structure. It's all there, but the dominant structure is on the system scale. And these are these simulations are very recent actually because we didn't have the large scale particle simulations because we actually didn't have the uh, computational technology to do such large simulations that also included steric interactions. So for those of you who, does anybody in here work on MD, molecular dynamics type problems? Maybe not so much. So molecular dynamics is, is you know, you, you have these kind of force laws that are, that are that communicating forces between parts of molecules, electrostatic forces, these forces, that forces. And the way you keep things from passing in through each other is you put a repulsive potential everywhere you have an object so that things, when they collide, they'll slow down and stop. That turns out for the, these types of problems that we work on, that's very slow. You get very constrained in your time stepping by having to resolve the gradients of that potential to keep things from overlapping. We use an event-based method that actually goes back to work in the 1990s for solid body dynamics, where what we do instead is that when two objects run into each other, we ask what are the forces that at the end of a time step make them exactly non-overlapping? And that's something called a complementarity method. And all of our large scale simulations use these kind of methods. They're actually very efficient. Okay, that's my long way of saying, 
we've been able to understand now through both large-scale simulation of bacterial suspensions, which are more actually more recent than our analysis of PDEs, uh, why we are seeing the emergence of large-scale structure in the full nonlinear simulations, not just that predicted by linear theory. And what this is actually showing you is the velocity-velocity correlation functions as a function of distance from some reference point, appropriately averaged. As you are changing the length of the computational box at fixed volume concentration, where you're seeing the emergence of basically statistical self-similarity in the structures that you see on the boxes. So there's a very peculiar thing where as you go to bigger and bigger boxes, they look more and more alike. They're just all kind of scaled up. We have arguments for that. Okay. That's, that's kind of a statistical physics game though. But you could ask other questions, which are kind of fun. You could say, well, okay, I have this model for how swimmers behave. How might that depend on being confined or being unconfined, questions like that. And so this is a simulation actually that I, I did a few years ago with uh, Severio Spagnole, who's in mathematics at Wisconsin. We'll see him on Friday. And what happens when you hit the button, and you just look at a little droplet of an active fluid, an extensile active fluid, that's inside of a just a bath. And so what it does is, because it's extensile, it wants to expand. And it turns out that when it expands, it excites a lot of instabilities that mathematically you can map on to Rayleigh-Taylor instabilities in porous media. It's really kind of peculiar. But mathematically, it has a very similar structure to classical instabilities in porous media. And this is what happens when you take a strip of them. They just kind of invade into the space and take it over and roil it, if you like. So that's kind of fun. You could ask, what happens if I confine an active fluid like this inside of a droplet? And so there's a lot of experiments of these sorts these days. I'm just going to show you some computations. And so here I have an active fluid, which is again is extensile. Okay, so it's this particle uh, kind of PDE, the Stoker Planck equation. And it's inside of a surface tension bearing interface. And you let it go. It has internal instabilities, I've been describing to you. And it's confined now by these boundaries, and you just get this kind of, you know, chaotic dynamics for the for the boundary. Interesting, but maybe not so useful. And so, what would happen, for example, if I if I took this kind of model, and I chose the parameters so it was a little more controlled? Maybe I make the surface tension bigger. Maybe I lower the activity of the of the active fluid inside. This kind of thing. And here are our droplets now, where you can make them do very functional things. So here is a droplet that just forms a little washing machine, just a rotating flow inside. That's its natural state. These, these are not self-propelled fluids. Here I've taken out, these are just active particles that produce extensile flows, but they're not motile. But they create motility by the way they organize inside. So this dipole particle kind of created inside a dipolar particle, which is which is a lot like the flows that you see when you take an oil droplet and you put it into a temperature gradient in a fluid because you get Marangoni stresses. And in another one, you had a quadru quadrupolar flow that just creates like a stretching, like the original particles themselves. So you can play games like that. And then you can try to answer or have fun with questions like what Phil Anderson asked is more different. What if I take many of these parts? And so now I'm just going to start off with a with a bunch, you know, in a corral, a bunch of these droplets that just want to form these rotary flows that I showed you on the previous one. I put them together. I kind of started off where 50 of them spin one way, 50 spin the other way, they're kind of randomly mixed, and I let them go. And then they are interacting through the fluid and thus affecting each other's internal activity. 
because they communicate stresses across the boundaries. They communicate velocities of the intervening fluid across the boundaries. And if you wait long enough, and it's a long time, then what you find is that they have had a winner-take-all dynamics where only one, so to speak, cell type survives. This has kind of a, like a biological sound to it. And all you're left with is two counter-rotating guys that are outliers, but just obstinate, persistently rotating in the other direction. So this is kind of something that we're working on now, trying to understand these types of systems. You can really think about cells, as, if you like, as kind of in some parable as active materials, and they're kind of influencing each other the way they move collectively and so forth. So this is kind of a, an amateur's game of that. OK, I think I'll skip this part. That's very pretty. I'll, I'll watch you, let you watch that. <laughs> This is what happens when you take such an active fluid and you put a polymer into it, just a passive polymer. And it turns out that passive polymer can organize uh, instabilities in the, in the surrounding fluid and give you this kind of chaotic dynamics. And we claim that uh, some of the dynamics is actually similar to what you see in long-term nuclear uh, behaviors inside the nucleus, but I'll leave that aside. It's too weird. Okay. so. Let me, yeah. I understand the DNA as. Okay, so in, if I gave a different version of this talk, I would say it's pole two. <laughs> so a, um, it's a, it's a, an enzyme that acts on chromatin because it's involved in doing transcription. But that is just that, that's a whole story which I'd rather not go into. But there are many motors and enzymes inside the nucleus that are performing work on DNA. And, you know, topoisomerases, uh, polymerases, lots of replic you know, replication, is replication domains are being replicated, these kinds of things. And that's work with Alexander Sadovska, who does nucleus biophysics, and we try to compare those with her experiments. Okay. Well, let me put this in. Now, let me just introduce a very, very different problem. This is like part two. And uh, we, we, none of us, I think, love houseflies or fruit flies, especially because they lay eggs. We don't like to think about, about flies laying eggs anywhere around us. But they're, they're really kind of fabulous creatures. So this is another model organism like C. elegans. And uh, how do they do it? So it turns out that they have a special organ, the females have a special organ, it's called the egg chamber. And the egg chamber is a collection of six, 16 cells that have divided from a single cell. And of those 16, this is at some stage, let's take stage 10. So over here are 15 cells that are now sacrificing their existence to the development of a single cell, which is the egg. So this guy right here, this black void, was originally one of these 16 cells. And so they produce a lot of the genetic factors that will determine the eventual kind of anatomical structure of the future mature fly. And so the fact that uh, there is a posterior and anterior relative to where these nurse cells are actually sets up a polar axis. The head will be on this side, the rest of it will be on this side and so forth. It happens at very early before any fertilization at all. There's a basic problem. I'm showing you, okay. These oocytes can reach scales of 300 microns. They're big. That's big. Why do they need to be big? That's because it's an egg. And so it has to have all the components to produce thousands of cells that will eventually hatch out of this egg and be a functional organism. So it needs to have all those components stored and ready to go. So they've got to be big. They have a lot of things to do. Now, if you take stage 10, that's about 150 microns, 100 microns, something like that. It takes 
20, about 24 hours to move a protein from here to the other side, just by, if you were just doing it by diffusion. The cytoplasm inside, the fluid inside of that egg is about a thousand times more viscous than water. And it will take you about a day to get a protein from here to there. Instead, what happens is you will see the emergence of large scale flows on the size of the egg cell. It has speeds of about 100 to 300 nanometers per second. Not fast, but given how big the egg is, that cuts the transport times down to about 20 minutes. Okay, now you may argue with me later, is it really having to do with transport? And I'll kind of, uh, you know, you'll see why, but it's interesting. So this is just using endogenous particles in a, in a microscope, showing you the emergence of one of these flows in a stage 10 oocyte. Okay, fluid mechanics. You don't see any sign of a no slip condition here. Where is the no slip condition? This is PIV, part of, you know, so those are showing streamlines for from PIV. This was done by people at in my in my group in center, uh, along with people at Princeton and uh, Northwestern. The experiments were done in Volodya's uh, his name, he has the last name, Gelfond. Uh, who's at Northwestern. And this is in collaboration with the Princeton group of Stosh Schwarzman, who's also a area leader in CCB, the Center for Computational Biology. Some of you know Stosh. So at 100 to 300 nanometers per second, that's called fast. Now, here's a picture, kind of a, a little schematic put forward by the Saxon lab about uh, 10 years ago, is to what they think the basic physics of this is. And they had a small scale simulation of this. But basically, it turns out that there are uh, microtubules or polymers that are emanating from the boundary of the cell. They seem to be anchored there. And there are motor proteins. And this motor protein is called a kinesin one. It's a motor protein that if the so-called minus end were embedded in the, in the cell wall right there, the plus end is off in the fluid, they will carry payloads to the free end. So those polymers are called microtubules. And there you can see these little legs, those are the motors, and there's a payload. And so now just imagine the scenario. I have an elastica. The elastica is anchored onto a wall. It's immersed in a viscous fluid and I have something carrying a payload of it. It's using it to walk. So that payload is exerting a force on the fluid as it's being dragged up. Newton's third law says there's gotta be an equal and opposite force on the substrate that is being walked up. So if this is what's going on, these kinesin one payloads are putting a compressive stress on that microtubule bed, on that bed of polymers. So this is a setup for a kind of theory of motor loaded elastica that are stuck onto the side of a wall. And the mathematics here is a little heavy, so I think I, I won't focus on it too much, except to say that we derived a model for this. And the model is, is something like this. I, I have a cell and around the boundary of the cell, I have a bed of polymers. There they are in green. And there's motors carrying payloads up of each of these polymers. And I describe that polymer bed by basically the arc length from the base of a single polymer and its anchoring point on the wall. We'll call that alpha, it's just the position on the wall. And there's a, a set of papers of you know, where we derive these things. But there's two dimensionless parameters in this model. One is a dimensionless motor force. How much force per unit length are these guys, these motors exerting on these, on these elastica? And the aerial density, how many microtubules per unit area are coming up out of the bank? Okay. And the more 
of those that you have coming up. The higher the density of microtubules, the more important hydrodynamic interactions become if they start to move in the fluid. And again, we use slender body for the Stokes equations. These are the, slender, the general slender body equations, the Stokes equations, moving the center line of a slender object relative to a background flow. There's an anisotropic drag tensor that sits here that says it's easier to push things along the axis than transversely to it. And this is the internal mechanics that comes from an Euler elastica. So I have bending rigidity, that's the fourth derivative, Force density is the fourth derivative with respect to position in space. So these are very stiff systems. And then there's a tensile stress that says that these elastica are inextensible. Okay, so we have like a pressure like axial force. And then there's this force field length acting along the axis. Dx dS is just the tangent vector. And so we have something that's exerting a force down the microtubule along the ten tangent vector to it towards the base. That comes with boundary conditions, which I won't discuss. And what this guy is, the fluid mechanicians here, this is the Lagrangian flow map of the fiber field. S and alpha are Lagrangian parameters for this fiber bed. You're parameterized by your arc length from the base and where your position is where you're, where you're pinned. This is actually the evolution of a Lagrangian flow map. It involves a force density, and that force density creates a field in the surrounding solvent fluid that creates a flow. And that flow is the flow to which the microtubule moves relative in producing a drag force. And this is what that looks like. This is that force Stokes equation. Again, it says, I integrate a force over the right-hand side that lives in the green zone. It involves a Jacobian that tells me I have a force in the Lagrangian frame. I need to translate it to the Lagrangian, to the Eulerian frame. That's this object right here. I have an aerial density. And that's the mechanical force that gets communicated. And I could tell you why that doesn't include the motor force, because it's dipolar, and these are the leading order parts of it. But that's what it looks like. And I think I'll skip that, except to say that there again is an energy balance equation. Instead of that configurational entropy, this is actually just the stored elastic energy in the fiber bed. It just says integrate over all the curvature squared of all these elastic. That's your total elastic energy. This time rate of change comes with two pieces. This is just dissipation that comes from the creation of, of just, you know, this is dissipation through gradients and Stokes equations. That's his first term. And the second is just dissipation that comes from dragging things through a fluid. So there's a dissipation and then there's an input power term that comes from the motors moving along the microtubules. So again, you have input power, you have dissipation. And if you have a non-trivial steady state where you're now in steady state, your elastic energy doesn't change, your fibers are not moving, what that means is that this input power here has to be positive, which means that the fiber has to be bent so it is aligned with the background flow. So that the motors are carrying stuff up and creating a flow which is aligning, it's kind of a chicken and egg problem, but it's aligning the fiber with the flow to create a non-trivial state. Okay, that's kind of the mechanics in brief. If you take those equations, and this is from a PRL from three years ago, if you take that, mo that model, it turns out that for any cell shape, you have an exact solution to those equations, an exact trivial solution that says that every fiber is pointing orthogonally from the boundary into the flow. And they, they all have a tension, which is, ne which is negative. Namely, they're all under compression from these motors moving on there. So I have this steady state, which is just like ready to go. Here I am being compressed. Don't flick me or I'm gonna do something. I'm gonna buckle, I'm gonna bend. So it's a loaded, it's a loaded elastica bed. And it turns out that 
it's unstable in certain regimes, that if you have enough motors or you have dense enough microtubules, then you can have oscillatory behavior. You can have damped oscillations. There's a Hopf bifurcation here along the single microtubule line where low bar is zero. But if you have enough microtubules, we have something that we call streaming, which is just a real eigenvalue that says, everybody wants to hydrodynamically couple and just bend over. And this is only there because you have enough to excite the fluid feedback. And this is what it does. That's in a cylinder, there's our 2D thing. All the microtubules in this model were pointing in. We put a little perturbation on it. They all folded over, created a big flow just by moving. But once they're bent over, now all their motors are moving along the inclined bed and it just drives the flow around. And you can, taking the rigidities of microtubules and the strengths of motors, five piconewtons, things like that, you can estimate that the flows that are seen inside the oocyte require somewhere around five motors per microtubule, something like that. Okay, how does this play out in a more full model? So now let's drop the coarse graining. And this is a simulation of about a thousand microtubules using this motor loading model inside of a spherical cell. Okay. So it's in a fluid. That's what it does. If they don't want to be straight, they're unstable. And what they do is they all pick an axis and they kind of bend around that axis and they produce a big solid body rotation essentially inside of the cell. This is why you don't see boundary, that's why you don't see a no slip condition in this because there's this bed of microtubules that are kind of bent over, we think in the experiment, that are pushing a big flow around. The activity is right on the boundary. You can see a no slip condition if you very probe very carefully in microscopy close to the boundary, but otherwise you don't really see it. You can see that there are defects as it's kind of relaxing into a steady state. And what the flow lines look like, you know, it's kind of rotating around. But if you look at the streamlines, it's two pieces. It's a big rotational flow. And because microtubules are pointing in because of the Harry Tubal theorem somewhere, right? They can't all be lying flat. So there's microtubules pointing in at the ends of the vortices, and those are pumps. And those pumps are creating secondary flows. They're about very small, 5% of the total flow speed. Now I'll skip that, except to say, you get a very, very similar stability diagram, phase diagram for the way it behaves to the full 3D. What happens if you use a real cell shape here? So what we did is we reconstructed a egg shape made it axisymmetric, and we embedded our simulation inside of this egg shape, which looks kind of like a truncated cone, stage 10. There it goes. You're looking at two halves of it. It forms a vortex very quickly, upper and lower part. You see these defects, so I have a big vortex going like this. And then over a very long time scale, it slowly reorients itself so that it becomes axisymmetric. So the formation of one of these, we call them twisters, one of these big vortices inside, which we think is what is being seen in the oocytes, happens very quickly. But over time, that is not stable, and the system reorients itself to find the axis of symmetry. And again, it has this kind of prototype flow of a rotation with kind of a bitoroidal component from jets coming in from the defects. So we have this kind of picture. We have two stages in the dynamics. One is the fast formation of one of these vortices. And so that gets you down onto some sort of plane or manifold where you have slow motion, which is just the rotation of this structure to find a fixed point where it's axis symmetric. And this, you know, we detail this at great length in a, in a paper, this two papers this year, one in nature physics, one in, one in PNAS. But it's like the, you know, it's elastic mechanics with forcing. 
these are all just fluid mechanic, you know, fluid structure problems. Let me just say, we can't hold the oocyte alive long enough at that stage to see whether it becomes axisymmetric. But what we can do is go to later stages in the development of these egg cells. And what you see almost universally is that the later stages, and this is work from a, from a graduate student at Princeton that Stoss and I co-advised, uh, Olenka Jane, then what you see is that uh, 22 out of 23 <laughs> of the excised uh, late stage oocytes show axisymmetric flow. And we have a big computational study that's now in the archive showing how the system evolves into this axisymmetric state. Okay. Those are the two things I wanted to tell you about. Um, so those two problems is kind of active materials inside of cells or active suspensions. And they're, they're kind of typical. So, you know, they both have aspects of self-organization. You start off with disorder in the bacterial suspensions, they become ordered. And it's kind of this weird statistical mechanics problem. Uh, but when you're talking about development, you can have self-organization of structure so that it forms a functional flow. For example, in the case of oocytes, you start off with something that is just kind of pointing in and then what it wants to go to actually is a global attractor we've shown in kind of amplitude equation world uh, is it wants to go into one of these big twisties. And really the, you know, you really need to look at these things through the lens of both large scale models and stripped down coarse grain models where you can really understand what the competing effects are. And uh, these are beautiful mechanics problems, weird mechanics problems. And this is a, a paper we had just appear in PRL a couple of weeks ago, looking at the mechanics of proliferating colonies of cells that are growing and dividing, where the rate at which you grow, grow to reach a division length is constrained by how much mechanical stress growth itself causes in the colony. And you get these beautiful ring patterns out of it. And uh, there's some of my collaborators. Let me just mention, uh, a lot of the early work on the oocyte took place with Ray Goldstein and also with uh, David Stein, who's at Flatiron. Scott Weedy has done a lot of the bacterial stuff. And this whole list of people, my long-term collaborator in many of these problems in cell dynamics is Dan Needleman and also is Tosh Schwartz. And thank you. Time for a few questions. If you're on Zoom and want to ask a question, feel free to type it into the chat and I'll read it out. So questions from the audience. Feel free to say no. <laughs> Please. Like a beautiful part of the, the last part of the act development, we understand that it's very important during the act development, the axis formation. I'm talking about AP axis as well as DE axis. Classic developmental biology study you have in final, the cellular in organization is very important. Yeah. Uh, I'm just curious. Right now, you have this active flow driven by this pillar like okay. chapter. Okay. Okay. So, I'm just curious whether the next step would be superimposing, uh, adding more cellular dynamics. There, there's two things to say about this. One is that a lot of the uh, location of polarity factors actually help, happens even before the flow takes place. And this has to do with competition between microtubules and actin in kind of binding structures of, of mRNA packets being moved around. And we're working with, with Gelfond on kind of models of diffusion models that have weird uh, kind of binding boundary conditions. So that's one thing. The second, if you really want to get things down to the other end, axisymmetric flows are the worst way to do it. So that's my next question. Yeah. Why? Yeah, that's right. And so I am not convinced that that actually has to do with transport entirely. I think it may have to do with suspension of yolk granules. So there are big fat particles that need to get suspended into the cytoplasm as the egg, as the embryo develops. And they are produced peripherally and they endocytose into the cell and they need to get suspended. And I think that those flows may have to do with that. So 
But if you if you knock down kinesin one, so those flows don't happen, the organism does not develop. It's a killer. So I think precisely what they're doing, I'm sure they're multifunctional, but precisely what they're doing is a little unclear, but they're there. So the difference between pushers and pullers changes the signs of alpha. Um, and uh, the pushers are a lot more make a lot more interesting stuff happen. Yeah. Is it because they they're they're more directionally unstable? Is, is they were they're, 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 that's the wrong way to think about them. <laughs> yeah. But and it really has to do with it doesn't have to do with their single particle dynamics, it has to do with their coupling, really. And um so part of what, so there are two basic instabilities in these systems. One has to do with stability from instability from isotropy. And what you learn from the analysis of the isotropic case is the source of the instability for pushers has to do with alignment of the dipoles. It doesn't have to do with concentration fluctuations. And kind of the way in, you, you don't really have an unstable mode in that way for, for pullers. It just doesn't work. Isn't the dipoles? Like you, maybe you could call it misalignment of dipoles in the second case. I'd have to go back and look at it to give you a okay. precise answer. I haven't looked at it in a while. How close are these, uh, in Stokesville, how close are these uh, organisms have to be? This is, all, this is all dilute suspension theory. So we're, we're talking about three body lengths separation, something like that, in the dilute case. Very interesting things happen when you go to higher concentrations, which we're just trying to understand now. When you go to higher concentrations, then uh, it turns <laughs> kind of weird. Uh, there's something like a screening length that starts to emerge. And instead of having that the flow structures are scaling on the box size, it turns out you end up getting little cells that are on, on about 10 body lengths. And inside of one of each of those cells, this is at high concentration, it goes to a completely kind of fractionated behavior. And instead now the cells now kind of all go on number of things that you have in the little volume. So it has a different scaling. And inside of those cells, you see a lot of chaotic dynamics. We don't understand that at all. But if it's, um... If, if three body lengths is the loop, how, how far away do we have to come and then you'll have an extra clue? Right? Okay, so so the what is predicted by theory is that you can be at any concentration and you will become unstable once your system size is sufficiently large. So you will always access instability by taking by going to the limit where L big L goes to infinity. In fact, in that velocity velocity correlation plot that I showed you, there's a theory, essentially a theory plot in there that came from a simulation, but it was from a reduced system where we take the size of the system relative to the size of the swimmer to infinity. In that scaling, the swimming part drops out and you just get something that doesn't really have a scale. <laughs> anymore. And then you kind of put a scale onto it by giving you the box, and then we calculate a correlation. And that seems to be matching pretty well with what you see. But, you know, you go to big enough system size at any volume concentration, you become unstable. What is uh, the relative grounds for velocity of the like number for it, it, it's, ar and... it's, it's around, for those flow speeds, it's around 100. Yeah, it's around packed by 100. So, um, when you have a pressure of pull up at the uh, system of equations for the hydrodynamics, it's not reversible anymore. That's the difference pushing at the end. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. So, it, it's a very weird system. If if um, let, let me put it slightly differently, drop any diffusions, okay? Then if you flow forward in time as a set of pushers, fine, you go do something. You go to these complicated flows. If you 
reverse the sign of time and flow backwards, that turns out to be exactly the same as doing forward in time polars. Yeah, yeah, okay, that's right. That's right. And then it will just become uniform. It's a very weird system. So it's reversible in that weird way. Yeah. All right, we have one question online and then after that, I think we'll cut it off, but I'd invite you to join us afterwards. We have some snacks outside and you can follow up with any questions there. So our question online is this, does the, does the theory suggest any optimization strategy in saving energy or increasing transport efficiency in the organisms? I hate those questions, um, probably. I don't have much to say about it. Yeah, okay. okay. I, will, I will say something. And this is not work of mine. This is work of Pekko Hosoe at MIT. That, uh, well, this, the first part is a statement that is not her work. This is just a measurement about, it turns out that bacteria use a very, very small fraction of their metabolism to locomote. This is not what they're spending all their energy on. Nonetheless, she has argued that the structure of the flagellum, the pitch, things like this, have through evolution become very optimized. But, you know, so it's an optimal part on something that is a very, actually a very small kind of metabolic cost. So, you know, that's kind of a mixed answer. It doesn't cost you a lot, but if you have enough time, you'll often use it. Okay. Join us for some reflections.